Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The double papillae reposition flap is used to cover defects created by labial or lingual gingival recession. The recession and the thin labial periodontium on the adjacent teeth make the double papillae reposition flap the treatment of choice for this defect on the left cuspid rather than a lateral sliding flap. A double papillae flap procedure cuspid will be demonstrated. The gingiva in this area has been anesthetized. A Bard Parker number 15 blade is used to remove the epithelial lining of the free gingiva bordering the cleft of recession. The incision is made to undermine the attachment of gingival tissues and extends through the attached gingiva into the alveolar mucosa at the apical border of the defect. A sharp curette is used to remove the excised lining of the gingival crevice. The curettage is extended subgingivally to ensure complete removal of the epithelial attachment. A thorough root planing should include the removal of the surface layer of the exposed root. The root must be planed until firm tooth substance has been reached and the root is absolutely smooth. In some cases, it may be impossible to avoid exposing dentine, although this is not the aim of the treatment. A vertical incision is started between the cuspid and lateral incisor and extended into the alveolar mucosa at the mesial aspect of this interdental papilla. A similar incision is made at the distal aspect of the papilla between the cuspid and first bicuspid. The mesial graft is separated from the underlying tissues by sharp dissection utilizing a Bard Parker 12B blade. Care is taken to create a graft of even thickness. The dissection is carefully performed on each side of the mesial graft until it is freed from the underlying tissue. This same procedure is then performed on the distal graft until it is also separated. As stated before, the thickness of the grafts should be kept as uniform as possible.
After the marginal aspects of the two graphs are separated from the underlying structures, they are reflected from the alveolar process with a mucoperiosteal elevator. The reflection of these two papillae is performed in such a way that they can be positioned together over the labial aspect of the cuspid tooth. The two grafts are sutured together with 5O silk suture. A fine atraumatic needle is used to prevent the tissue from being torn as it is passed through the papillae. The grafts must be handled very carefully to avoid interference with the blood supply from surgical trauma. The depth of the bite of suturing should be shallow and yet provide adequate retention for approximation of the two grafts. The papillae are sutured together starting at the apex of the cleft and then proceeding toward the cemento-enamel junction or cervical line. Sutures are placed so as to permit union of the papillae without affecting their vascularity. The two cut surfaces are brought into close contact to enhance healing by primary intent. Only the minimum number of sutures needed to hold the grafts together should be used. In this case, the grafts will be adequately unified with three sutures. The tip of the unified graft is too narrow to cover the root surface and is trimmed off with surgical scissors. In order to secure the desired position of the united flap over the denuded root surface, a needle is passed from the palatal aspect between the cuspid and the bicuspid teeth and the suture drawn to the labial side. The needle is then inserted through the distal half of the flap and pass back through the same interproximal space. This suture is passed through the interproximal space between the lateral incisor and the cuspid tooth from the palatal side. It is then inserted through the mesial aspect of the flap. After the suture needle has again been passed through the same interproximal area, the sutures are tied on the palatal aspect of the cuspid. A gauze sponge moistened with sterile saline solution is used to place the flap in the desired position and to hold it firmly against the tooth for about one Two and one half acromycin ointment is placed over the area of the surgery. Dry foil is adapted to the area of surgery with a gauze sponge. The surgical dressing is applied over the foil.
It is molded to the tissues and adapted proximally with a plastic instrument. The border of the dressing is molded with the lips so it does not impinge upon the mucobuccal fold after it sets. Surgical dressing is also placed on the palatal act to protect the area of the surgery and secure the dispensary suture. The occlusion is checked to assure that the dressing is not interfering with the dental function. This is the operative site one week after surgery. The surgical dressing has been removed. There is some debris on the surface of the graft, but the surgical defects are filling in with granulation tissue and the grafted flap is vital. The sutures have now been removed. The two initial grafts are well united. Acromycin ointment is again put over the area of surgery and a new surgical dressing is applied. This will be left in place for one week. Three weeks post-operatively, the gingival tissues have not regained their normal color or keratinization. However, the previous cleft has been covered by the flap which appears to be attached to the denuded root. In addition to the improved aesthetic, there has been a gain of attached gingiva over the cuspid. Five months postoperatively, the grafted area has healed well. As evidenced by probing, the grafted papillae have become attached to the labial aspect of the cuspid in the area of the previous labial cleft. The aesthetic and functional results appear to be excellent. This film will demonstrate a double papillae reposition flap procedure performed on a maxillary canine tooth. A portion of the tooth's root surface has become denuded of its periodontium. The anesthesia is administered by infiltration into the tissues adjacent to the cleft. A periodontal probe shows that the base of the pocket extends to the mucogingival junction and ends in the alveolar mucosa. This type of cleft will present additional problems if the pocket is allowed to continue to deepen. The two interdental papillae on either side of this cleft will serve as good donor tissue to be joined together to cover the denuded root surface of the canine tooth. We would not use a laterally repositioned flap from the premolar because there is a very narrow band of attached gingiva. Similarly, the lateral incisor has some recession, and there is a narrow band of gingiva there. This is why the double papillae is the procedure of choice. Using a scalpel blade, the first aspect of this procedure is to remove the marginal tissue bordering the cleft. This is done by removing the gingival margins along the boundaries of the cleft as little tissue as possible is removed. The aspirator is being used to remove any blood or saliva. With the Goldman Fox number 12 instrument, the marginal tissue is stripped away from the gingiva bordering the defect.
fine tissue scissors and cuticle nippers are also used. It is important to prepare the root surface. Using the Goldman Fox curette, root planing is begun to remove any calculus deposits, plaque, and any soft tooth surface, such as necrotic cementum or dentin. The procedure is carefully and meticulously carried out to ensure adequate preparation of the root surface to receive the flap. A curette, the Goldman Fox number four, is used to plane the cementum to a smooth finish. The scalpel creates a vertical releasing incision at the mesial buccal line angle of the first premolar. This is repeated at the distal labial line angle of the lateral incisor. These are the distal borders of the two papillae which will be used as the flap after they are joined together to cover the denuded canine root surface. Having made the vertical releasing incisions, the two papillae are separated from their lingual halves with the scalpel blade. Using a periosteal elevator, a full thickness of the lateral canine papillae is reflected and placed over the root surface. The procedure is repeated on the canine premolar papilla, which borders the distal part of the cleft. The reflection of these two papillae is carried out in such a way so that they can be positioned together over the root surface of the canine tooth. In order to allow proper mobility of the flap, the vertical releasing incisions are extended a bit more into the alveolar mucosa. The vascular supply for both these papillae are within the pedicles themselves, and these vessels have been dissected with the flap. The two papillae are brought in contact and are now ready to be joined. A 5-0 or 6-0 suture with an atraumatic needle having a reversed cutting bevel is used. This prevents the tissue from being torn as the needle is passed through both papillae. The papillae are joined together starting at the apex of the cleft and then proceeding toward the cemento enamel junction or the cervical line. Sutures are placed so as to permit union of the papillae without affecting their vascularity. A second suture is placed in the same fashion. In this way, the two interdental papillae become one flap to be positioned over the root surface. One attempts to bring the two cut surfaces into close contact to enhance healing by primary intent.
A third suture is placed through both papillae to close the small cleft that now exists between them in the coronal area. It is obvious that the flap has sufficient length to cover the previously denuded root surface and at the same time extends slightly over the cervical line of the tooth onto the enamel surface. This extension of the flap margin onto the enamel is desirable because in healing, slight shrinkage will take place and result in the gingival margin ending at the cemento enamel junction. A fourth suture is placed in the flap to complete the approximation of the papilla. A suture is now placed through the marginal aspect of the flap and tied. One end is cut off. Then the needle is passed through the interdental area, distal to the canine, and carried to the palatal side. The needle is again brought to the labial surface and passed through the mesial margin of the flap. Without drawing it tight, the suture is snapped through the contact point. The single and looped strands on the palatal side are brought together and tied. This brings the joined papilla firmly against the canine. The small amount of labial plate showing is in the interdental area between the lateral incisor and the canine, and the slight area between the canine and the first premolar. This minimal amount of exposure of the underlying supporting tissues is one of the advantages that this procedure has over the laterally repositioned flap. A piece of sterile gauze saturated with warm water is kept over the operative site for 30 seconds. This permits close adaptation and removes any dead spaces and minimizes bleeding between the flap and the tooth prior to the application of the periodontal dressing. The dressing that is initially placed over the area is the Bear Sumner Periodontal Pack. It is reinforced with a pack whose formula is very similar to the Kirkland Pack. This second pink colored pack is the Goldman periodontal dressing and is placed on the labial and palatal aspect.
College pliers adapt the labial palatal portions of the pack. If one is concerned that the patient may lose the pack, adhesive dry foil may be applied over the periodontal dressing. This is carefully adapted. The patient is instructed not to chew in this area for the six to seven days between the procedure and the dressing change. The dressing is replaced at the end of a week. The sutures are removed and a new dressing placed for the second and then sometimes the third week. The area will heal rather uneventfully and the cleft should be repaired. The following drawings will review the double papillae reposition flap procedure that has been demonstrated. The first drawing shows the cleft on the labial surface of the maxillary left canine tooth. The mucogingival junction is marked MGJ. The two papillae A and B are noted in this illustration. P indicates the periosteum of the alveolar crest. The suturing technique which joins the two papillae A and B and secures this flap to the tooth is shown here. This is the final post-operative appearance of the area. The post-operative appearance of the treated site nine months later demonstrates that there is an adequate zone of gingiva on the canine tooth. The donor sites have healed completely and new interdental papillae have formed. The periodontal probe is introduced into the sulcus and a one and a half millimeter gingival sulcus is present when pressure is applied to the probe. Movements of the lip and alveolar mucosa shows that there is no retraction of the gingival margin on the canine. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.